Ever wish you could like snag a life coach from, you know, ancient Rome? <laughs> Me too. And guess what? We kind of can. We're diving into the mind of Marcus Aurelius. Roman Emperor Andy Stoic philosopher. Don't forget that part. Talk about a resume. <laughs> to uncover his wisdom, which is shockingly still super relevant for navigating modern life. And it's not like he was, you know, cranking out self-help bestsellers. Oh, holy. These were his personal reflections. Right. Never meant for publication. Which I think makes it even more fascinating, right? Absolutely, yeah. This intimate glimpse into the mind of a guy running an empire. Literally. While pondering virtue and self-control. Talk about high-pressure multitasking. Mm -hmm. So we're cracking open book seven of his uh, meditations. Think of it as journal entries, but like packed with stoic strategies for handling whatever life. Or maybe, you know, ruling an empire. Throws at you. Exactly. And what's striking is how much of his advice still resonates today. Oh, absolutely. Just like his era was full of upheaval and uncertainty. Which, hello, isn't that familiar? Oh, right. Aren't we constantly facing the unexpected? Totally. Which is why I love where he kicks things off in Meditation 30. Aurelius talks about how much energy we waste on things totally outside our control. Sound familiar? Oh, it's the core of Stoicism, right? Yeah. Accepting what we can't change and focusing on what we can. Mm. He's not saying ignore your problems, but rather focus your energy where it actually makes a difference. Okay, makes sense. Just like Aurelius couldn't control every rebellion on the edge of the empire. You can't control the economy, global pandemics. Or whether our favorite coffee shop is out of oat milk, right? The worst. <laughs> the worst. But Aurelius reminds us that our inner world, our thoughts, our reactions, that's our true domain. It's about finding that sense of agency, even in the midst of external chaos. So how do we actually shift that focus? It's easy to say, focus on what you can control. Right. But how do we actually put it into practice, especially when it feels like everything's hitting the fan? Mm. Here's the thing. It's not about ignoring the external, but about choosing our response to it. This is where the real power lies, okay? <laughs> Let's say you're facing a setback at work. Okay, I'm with you. Lost that promotion I was really gunning for. Instead of dwelling on the unfairness, which you can't change, Wrong. focus on what you can control. Improving your skills, seeking mentorship, or even how you choose to view the situation. Okay. It's about finding that proactive edge, even within limitations. So it's about accepting the things we can't change and then channeling our energy toward what we can actually influence. You got it. And this leads us to Aurelius's next point in Meditation 31, which is all about finding opportunity and adversity. Oh, I love this one. It's easy to get stuck in a negative spiral when things go wrong, mm. but Aurelius is pushing us to see challenges as a chance for growth. Absolutely. Yeah, it's so easy to get like completely derailed when something doesn't go your way. Totally. But to like shift your perspective and see it as a chance to learn and grow. It's huge. That's huge. And you know, it ties into something else Aurelius talks about, which is this idea of self-control. Oh yeah. The Stoics were all about mastering those emotions. Big time. Not letting them run the show. Exactly. Aurelius believed that our ability to think rationally, even when things are tough, that's what sets us apart. So it's like our emotions are kind of like, I don't know, a runaway train. And our reason is like the brake system. Okay, I like that. And just like, you know, you've got to maintain those brakes, right? You got to keep them in good working order. Right. Self-control is like that. It's a practice. It's something we have to work at consistently. And Aurelius... He wasn't just talking about this stuff, right? He actually lived it. Oh, absolutely. Even when things are really rough for him. There's that story in meditations where he's dealing with physical pain, like real discomfort. And instead of letting it completely take over, he uses his reason to stay calm. Wow. He's basically showing us, hey, this is what it looks like to train your mind to endure hardship. So it's like building that mental resilience. Yes, yeah. exactly. One challenge at a time. And, you know, it's funny. It's like what we're talking about today with mindfulness and emotional regulation. It's like all this stuff is rooted in these ancient stoic principles. It's true. When you can observe your emotions without judgment, without letting them totally carry you away, it's like you're strengthening that self-control muscle. Exactly. And that's a game changer for how you deal with stress, relationships, everything. It's like Marcus Aurelius, secret mindfulness guru. Who knew? Right. But it makes sense. It does. Because it's not just some abstract philosophy. Sure. It's about how we show up in our lives. So self-mastery, it's not just about like 
meditating on a mountaintop somewhere. Right. It's about navigating those daily challenges with a bit more, I don't know, grace. Absolutely. More resilience, more clarity, and honestly, more compassion. Compassion. I like that. Yeah. Because it seems like we've been like really focusing inward so far. Sure. But really, it's also had a lot to say about how we treat others, right? Oh, absolutely. Which brings us to a really important part of Stoicism understanding other people's perspectives. Okay. He talks about this in Meditation 34, how we need to consider other people's motivations, their viewpoints, even when, maybe especially when, we don't agree with them. It's like everyone's walking around with their own story, their yeah. own experiences. And we can't just assume we know what those are. Right, exactly. Aurelius was convinced that everyone acts based on their own understanding of the world, right? Like shaped by their experiences, their values, their own internal struggles. So someone who seems, I don't know, insensitive or rude. Yeah. There might be something else going on beneath the surface. Exactly. It's like yeah. that saying, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. And Aurelius isn't saying, hey, just excuse bad behavior. Mm -hmm. But by trying to understand where someone's coming from, we can approach the situation with a little more empathy. Right. And maybe, just maybe, find a way to work through conflict more effectively. So we should try to remember that everyone's fighting their own battles. Right, offer a little grace. Just like we hope others would offer us a little grace. Exactly, Th this idea of like understanding our place in the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. It connects to something else Aurelius talks about, right? Yeah. Our interconnectedness. It does. He goes back to this in Meditation 30, actually. Oh, yeah. How we all have a role to play. Even if we can't control, well, everything. Because that's impossible. <laughs> totally. But we're still part of something larger than ourselves. We are. And our actions, even the small ones, they matter. It's like that ripple effect thing. Exactly. Like, what are you good at? What lights you up? Maybe it's volunteering. Maybe it's being there for a friend. Maybe you make a mean lasagna and you share it with your neighbor. Love that. So it's less about, like, needing to achieve some crazy level of success. Or be some kind of superhero. Yeah. And more about focusing on showing up authentically. Yes. And contributing what you can right where you are. So it's not just about being the change, it's realizing we're already part of this web of interconnection. Yeah. And that's a really important thing about stoicism. It's not about being perfect. Oh, thank goodness. It's about the practice, right? Like, life is messy, we're all figuring things out as we go. And Aurelius was right there with us. He was, which is kind of comforting when you think about it, right? It is. This guy, Emperor of Rome, dealing with crazy pressure and responsibility. And still grappling with those same questions. How to be a good human. How to deal with hardship. The struggle is real. But he found some answers in these stoic principles. He did. And those answers, they're still relevant today. They are. They remind us that even when things are tough, even when it feels like everything's out of control, we still have a choice. We have a choice in how we respond. Yes. I like that. That's powerful. It is. Well, this has been quite the deep dive. I know, right? Marcus Aurelius, what a mind. As we wrap up, what's the one thing you really hope our listener takes away from exploring his meditations? You are not powerless. Even when it feels that way, you have a choice. And those choices, they have the power to transform your life. And that is the timeless wisdom of Marcus Aurelius. It really is. A huge thank you to our listeners for joining us on this journey through Stoic philosophy. We'll see you next time. Wake up with purpose, feel that fire in your chest. Life's a gift, man. Breathe it in, give it your best. Stars in the sky, a mirror of what's inside. Change is the game, let your spirit be your guide. So Unbreakable, that's the key Control your thoughts, find the strength to set yourself free Can you fly in a world full of noise and stress The truth lies within you, put your soul to the test Anger burns hot, but revenge leaves you cold Kindness is the weapon, that's how the story's told Don't judge a book by its cover, hook deep or stand Find the good in everyone, let that wisdom spread Storm right in mind, unbreakable, that's the key Control your thoughts, time to track to set yourself free Can you fly in the world full of noise and stress The truth lies within you, put your soul to the test Yeah, they try to knock you down, 
throw pops to coach your way But you rise above the drama, find peace every day The happiness of your life depends on the quality of thoughts Keep that fire burning bright, the power you got Slow down, Think goes the curveball, but you adapt, never fold. The past is gone, the future untold. Live in the moment, that's where the true power lies. A slow wake warrior, wisdom in your eyes. If it is not right, do not do it. Keep it real. The soul becomes sky with the color of its thoughts. How you feel? Slow it, oh, unbreakable. Find the strength within. You got this, no doubt. The victory you'll win. Critics talk loud, try to dim your inner light. But they ain't worth your time. Rise above the petty fight. Remember everything we hear is an opinion, not a fact. Stay true to your path, keep your integrity intact. It's not death a man should fear, but never beginning to live. So seize the day, let your spirit soar. Got so much to give. Focus on the good, leave the negativity behind. Stow with warrior state of mind. That's the legacy you'll find. Great decision making. And then one day I'm hoping that we elite. So this book, almost 300 pages, the New York Times bestseller. The LA Times bestseller, USA Today, that didn't happen because I'm a genius. It happened because of some decisions I made. Is that clear? Look, if we don't do anything else, if you walk out of this room today, you owe you to make good decisions. Because when you make bad decisions, you destroy you. You're killing you. You're destroying you. And I told you, you live in a country that if you make good decisions, you reap the benefits of it. I get up at three because it's silent. It's easier to be focused when the environment is focused. So a lot of you, you don't have, be honest, be honest. We're not playing no games here. Talk to Sam, we got a way to help you after this. How many of you, honestly, you are knocking on doors and grinding and making moves, but you don't necessarily have every single step written down for every single day. Just be honest. Some of y'all, you in the dark. That, see, that's the problem. So we're going to help y'all. I, I got a plan. We're going to work with y'all. I'm going to do some z video, give it to y'all. I'm going to show y'all really how to walk through this. Because the day I got up, and every day now I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Here's what's funny. Most of you wake up and you try to make money. Listen to me. If you would make you, <laughs> money would come to you. Okay, you missed that whole thing I just said. If you would make you a better person, you'd make more money. Now, watch what I do. The way people spend their money or treat their money is how I treat my time. All right, let me explain what I mean to you. I make sure that every single day in that 24 hour period that I'm getting a whole bunch of wins. So I'm supposed to be doing this at this time, doing this at this time, doing this at this time, doing this at this time. The problem with most of you, you waking up and you worshiping money. Carefully consider the negative signs that people give off and immediately. There is nothing more important to true growth than realizing that you are not the voice of the mind. You are the one who hears it. Let go of the past and let the future take care of itself. Buddha Choose not to be harmed, and you won't feel harmed. Don't feel harmed, and you haven't been. A life without cause is a life without effect. The only thing that's keeping you from getting what you want is the story you keep telling yourself. Tony Robbins And who is able to compel you to assent to that which appears false? No man. And who can compel you not to assent to that which appears true? No man. By this then you see that there is something in you naturally free. But to desire or to be averse from 
or to move toward an object or to move from it, or to prepare yourself, or to propose to do anything, which of you can do this, unless he has received an impression of the appearance of that which is profitable or a duty? No man. You have then in these thongs also something which is not hindered and is free. Wretched men, work out this, take care of this, seek for good here. And how is it possible that a man who has nothing, who is naked, houseless, without a hearth, squalid, without a slave, without a city, can pass a life that flows easily? See, God has sent you a man to show you that it is possible. Look at me, who am without a city, without a house, without possessions, without a slave. I sleep on the ground, I have no wife, no children, no praetorium, but only the earth and heavens and one poor cloak. And what do I want? Am I not without sorrow? Am I not without fear? Am I not free? When did any of you see me failing in the object of my desire? Or ever falling into that which I would avoid? Did I ever blame God or man? Did I ever accuse any man? Did any of you ever see me with sorrowful countenance? And how do I meet with those whom you are afraid of and admire? Do not I treat them like slaves, who, when he sees me, does not think that he sees his king and master? This is the language of the cynics, this their character, this is their purpose. You say no, but their characteristic is the little wallet and staff and great jaws, the devouring of all that you give them, or storing it up, or the abusing unseasonably all whom they meet, or displaying their shoulder as a fine thing. Do you see how you are going to undertake so great a business? First take a mirror, look at your shoulders, observe your loins, your thighs. You are going, my man, to be enrolled as a combatant in the Olympic Games. No frigid and miserable contest. In the Olympic Games a man is not permitted to be conquered only and to take his departure. But first he must be disgraced in the sight of all the world, not in the sight of Athenians only, or of Lacedaemonians or of Nicopolitans. Next he must be whipped also if he has entered into the contests rashly. And before being whipped, he must suffer thirst and heat and swallow much dust. Reflect more carefully, know thyself, consult the divinity. Without God attempt nothing, for if he shall advise you, be assured that he intends you to become great or to receive many blows. For this very amusing quality is conjoined to a cynic. He must be flogged like an ass. And when he is flogged, he must love those who flog him. As if he were the father of all and the brother of all. You say no. But if a man flogs you, stand in the public place and call out, Caesar. What do I suffer in this state of peace under thy protection? Let us bring the offender before the proconsul. But what is Caesar to a cynic? Or what is a proconsul? Or what is any other except him who sent the cynic down hither and whom he serves, namely Zeus? Does he call upon any other than Zeus? Is he not convinced that whatever he suffers it is Zeus who is exercising him. Hercules, when he was exercised by Eurystheus, did not think that he was wretched, but without hesitation he attempted to execute all that he had in hand. And is he who is trained to the contest and exercised by Zeus going to call out and to be vexed, he who is worthy to bear the scepter of Diogenes? Hear what Diogenes says to the passers-by when he is in a fever. Miserable wretches, will you not stay? But are you going so long a journey to Olympia to see the destruction or the fight of athletes? And will you not choose to see the combat between a fever and a man? Would such a man accuse God who sent him down as if God were treating him unworthily, a man who gloried in his circumstances and claimed to be an example to those who were passing by? For what shall he accuse him of? because he maintains a decency of behavior, because he displays his virtue more conspicuously? 
Well, and what does he say of poverty, about death, about pain? How did he compare his own happiness with that of the great king? Or rather he thought that there was no comparison between them. For where there are perturbations and griefs and fears and desires not satisfied, and aversions of things which you cannot avoid, and envies and jealousies, how is there a road to happiness there? But where there are corrupt principles, there these things must of necessity be. When the young man asked, if when a cynic is sick, and a friend asks him to come to his house and be taken care of in his sickness, shall the cynic accept the invitation, he replied, and where shall you find, I ask, a cynic's friend? For the man who invites ought to be such another as thee, that he may be worthy of being reckoned the cynic's friend. He ought to be a partner in the cynic's scepter and his royalty, and a worthy minister, if he intends to be considered worthy of a cynic's friendship. As Diogenes was a friend of Antisthenes, as Crates was a friend of Diogenes. Do you think that, if a man comes to a cynic and salutes him, he is the cynic's friend? and that the cynic will think him worthy of receiving a cynic into his house, so that if you please reflect on this also,